You're now listening to The Sound of Sanity. This sound will continue for the duration of the program. Welcome to Sound of Sanity. My name is Nathan Ivers, and I'm your humble and obedient host, bringing you a dose of Christian sanity for the next however long this episode goes. With my two compatriots in the world of sanity, we've got associate producer Benjamin J. Solzer. Here I am, Nathan. And here you are, and you can do no, none other than to make great podcasts, right, Ben? I can do none other. Here I stand. You're actually sitting down. Hey, here I sit. And also sitting is Pastor Jacob Menzel, the pastor who's a master of all things sane. How are we doing, Jake? Good, Nathan. How are you? Doing especially fantastic because today's episode is entitled Nazi Vegetables. I just think that's a cool title for an episode. We're going to talk about something. It's, we're going to do, I guess, technically it's a cold take, but probably it's hot to a lot of our listeners because it's something that happened here locally in the town. From whence we live. Well, and it gets at a lot of tensions that I think we all feel all the time, whether or not there's an incident like this, you know, in our face, there's always something. That's mm-hmm. absolutely right. And good news, the New York Times published an article in August that actually featured the story we're going to talk about and casting our little old city in not the most flattering light. No. Well, at least there's finally reason for the rest of the country to hate the Midwest. <laughs> oh, Ben, you're a card. Okay, so this article, titled Amid the Kale and Corn Fears of White Supremacy at the Farmer's Market, focuses on the recent controversy at the local Bloomington Farmer's Market. The very farmer's market that my wife shops at, or used to, until I said she shouldn't, due to the thing we're about to talk about? The very same, Nathan. Wow. All right. So, author Jack Healy, who of the New York all our Times. listeners know, yes. yeah, uh, begins his article by connecting gluten-free bread and shotguns. Wow, that is a hook. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, quote, Justin Williams was baking a tray of gluten-free seeded bread for the next morning's farmer's market when his phone buzzed. It was a friend who grows organic sprouts, nervously wondering if he should bring along a shotgun to market. New York Times, Unquote. you have my attention. So, um... Just what exactly is the story that gave us such a headline and such a lead? Jake, don't worry. Healy explains it all. He's on the beat. He's on it. It began with, quote, allegations that a husband and wife who had been longtime sellers of organic tomatoes and kale were also white nationalists. The accusations exploded into public view after activists and online sleuths used federal court records in the leaked archives of a far-right message board. To uncover a digital trail they say connects the couple who own Schooner Creek Farm to an organization that promotes white nationalism and white American identity. Quote, in recent weeks, residents packed public meetings to debate whether Schooner Creek should be asked to leave or allowed to stay. There were protests and counter protests. The situation grew so volatile that Bloomington's mayor suspended the market late last month over public safety concerns. The market has more than 130 vendors and draws as many as 12,000 people downtown at the height. Continuing the article, anti-fascist Antifa protesters showed up one weekend dressed in black to stand in front of Schooner Creek Farms vegetable stall. A week later, armed members of a conservative militia group drove into Bloomington to support the farm against what they called anti-fascist enemies. Online members of white nationalist groups have seized on the story and rallied behind Schooner Creek, end quote. Okay, to sum it up, basically, there's some random farmer, this Schooner Creek farm people, he, him and his wife, they sell at the farmer's market. Uh, they posted in a white nationalist message board, or at least one of them did, I think the wife, and soon everyone in the fair city of Bloomington, where we live, was yelling about Nazi vegetables. Right, and the net result was that my brother, who is a police officer here in town, Bloomington PD, he told me he was afraid he might actually have to miss my wedding, which was happening around the time that this all went down because there might be a riot when they, they, they might just need to call him in, like things were getting really tense and heated around the farmer's market. And Mrs. Schooner has said things online and in subsequent interviews that rightly get her associated with that crowd. She doesn't call herself a white supremacist. She does call herself an identitarian, which is a distinction she makes that allows her to say that she takes a great deal of pride in her white heritage, but she's not racist. So there's a distinction there. But then she's posting on these forums or was at a certain point period in her life posting on these forums that really have all kinds of people saying all kinds of horrible things. 
Right. I think most of us would, to say the very least, see less of a distinction than she sees when she wants to hurry to say, oh, I'm just a white nationalist, not a white supremacist. Well, Um, okay. Yeah. Great. But just the same, a person having said regrettable things on the internet does not make them necessarily a dangerous or violent person. Right. And so then you have the Bloomington Antifa, you know, the anti-fascists, and they're actually causing concerns for violence and for, for danger. They're making my brother, the police officer, afraid he might have to miss my wedding. Right. So until anybody knew anything about comments that Mrs. Schooner had said online, Bloomington's farmer's market was just like any other farmer's market, completely safe, fun, family-friendly place to take your kids, except for the fact that crunchy liberals of Bloomington were going to feel very comfortable maybe being lesbians or whatever in public. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That was the thing that if you were a Christian, you had to worry about. Right. But now you have to worry about, and the police have to worry about these protesters who, and these protesters potentially being violent. And then, well, because these protesters are going to show up and maybe potentially be violent, then we're going to have counter protesters that may also be violent. And now we've got an escalating situation. Right. It mm-hmm. actually brings the worst of both sides. So you have an- the more violent Antifa kind of people show up. And then that caught, you know, it's like Joker and Batman. It Then then mm-hmm. the kind of na- the really, truly the real. nasty conservatives. I don't just want to pile up on the liber- liberals here too much because then like the, the actual white supremacist kind of people come out of the woodwork. And are, so we have protests, counter protests. Things got scary enough that my brother, the police officer, told me, like, I'm not letting my wife go to the... And I told my wife, she, mm-hmm. she loves to go to the farmer's market. Like, Meredith, you can't go to the farmer's market. And then the mayor of Bloomington released this statement, quote, I joined the vast majority of Bloomingtonians in abhorring and unequivocally condemning the odious doctrine of white supremacy. We know how important speaking out against hate is these days with events and statements in our country and around the world seeming to open the door for hateful ideologies. That is some good stuff. We do not support hateful ideologies. Uh, I mean, we don't, but are you sure that's good stuff there, Nathan? Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem, of course, is mob justice. Oh, yeah. Mob justice? Wait. Okay, so look, here's what happens. You have some farmers post some dumb stuff on a dumb message board some years ago, and then you have these escalating protests and anger. It gets out of control, so far out of control that Nathan's brother is going to miss Nathan's wedding. However bad you want to say the Schroener Farms people were, we were suddenly equating them with some really scary people, people who burn crosses, people who kill and murder and cause holocausts and stuff. And... We were reacting to them that way. Right. We, yeah, we turned them into monsters. And so then you have the mayor and the New York Times willing to propound the narrative that we have racist, hateful, bigot monsters among us when it hasn't actually been established that we do. Or that they pose any threat, whatever their their feelings are. And that's nothing new. I mean, we've seen the stories of how mob justice works on the internet, on Twitter. You know, you hear the stories of somebody making a mistake or saying something dumb or, or even committing a real sin. You know, by the time the plane lands, they've lost their job because the internet destroyed them, turned them into monsters. Some of us may have even experienced something a little bit like that when we posted a little article on feminism and uh, we sure did. women's roles. And <laughs> what is this we that we're talking about? You know, you know about. how sometimes people right post <laughs> 3,000 words on, on women's roles in Star Wars and yeah, movies yeah. and pop culture, and then people are sending them images of people's heads being cut off and saying this should happen to you and there's lots of people saying you, you guys have all had this happen to you right yeah sounds a little far-fetched actually yeah Amazing. you're right you're right nothing like that would ever happen nothing to worry about nope <laughs> jake christians are smarter than that yeah guys except for i think you're both morons because hey. actually christians do it all the time you guys remember the revoice conference you mean the conference it's all about, and I quote, supporting, encouraging, and empowering gay, lesbian, same-sex attracted, and other LGBT Christians so they can flourish while observing the historic Christian doctrine of marriage and sexuality? Wow, Jake, you, you memorized that? Oh, yeah, man. I memorize heretical trash all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Jake does. Taylor Swift lyrics. <laughs> uh, so that's got to do what with this? Okay, so look, we've talked at length in the past about the inroads that perverse sexuality is made and is making in historically conservative churches such as the PCA. Doesn't the bluster that Christians make when they're doing something like Revoice have some of the same stench to it as the mayor of Bloomington saying he joins the vast majority of Bloomingtonians in abhorring and unequivocally condemning blah, 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 blah. 
Yeah, so the mob has given a ruling. It said, there's evil white supremacist in Bloomington, and the mayor, uh, I mean, he's tipping his hat to due process, and he's alleged this or that. He wants to make sure everyone knows that he's cool. He's not against the mob. No. That's the point of his article. Neither was Pontius the statement, Pilot. I mean. What? What'd you say? I said neither was Pontius Pilate. Oh, so your hand feeling a little heavy there, Nathan? You're saying I'm being heavy-handed, Ben? Actually, if the shoe fits. Right! Okay, so listen, here's the question that I think we should be asking, which is, how much of our posturing uh, as Christians on certain progressive talking points is just us capitulating to mob rule? Au contraire, Robespierre. Read a little history. There's no appeasing the mob. If you keep empowering them, they'll come for you eventually. Yeah, we see that happen all the time. Hashtag blackface Justin Trudeau. Yeah, or, or you guys have seen the stories of second and third wave feminists who suddenly find themselves hated because they've been fighting for women, women, W-O-M-Y-N's rights. And then suddenly the transgender women are trying to steal those rights for themselves. And so the feminists aren't happy and the snake ends up eating its tail. And suddenly the people that were the liberal progressives are now the monsters. Like, Yeah, they created the liberal outrage machine that ends up chewing them up. Dr. Guillotine mounts the scaffold. Yeah, and so here's our contention, and that's that Christians who empower the mob will eventually be destroyed by it. Because here's what happens. You have somebody step out of line with the thought police, and then the thought police pronounces a verdict. Right. The verdict is, you are a Nazi. Then they require everybody else to line up, proclaim from the rooftops that they are also not Nazis. Nobody go buy vegetables from this person. This person is a Nazi. If you buy vegetables from this person, then you two are a Nazi. And so then you have this thing where it's like, now in order to prove to everyone else that I'm not a Nazi, I have to discriminate against this person in the marketplace and not buy any of their normal prosaic tomatoes. Right. And this kind of thing happens over and over and over again all over the place where the thought police tell us we have to prove that we're not racist. We have to prove that we're not anti-gay. We have to prove that we're not sexist. And so that's, you know, That's why we brought Revoice up, right? Revoice is a bunch of Christians lining up to protest that we're not homophobic. We're not anti-gay. We're actually very pro-gay. And the instant that we do this, we fall into that line of thinking where the thought police says, prove to us that you are not this evil thing that we've constructed. What we do is we fall into the pattern. We enable that pattern of mob justice to continue. And eventually it's going to come and it's going to eat us up. They're not going to be satisfied with us saying, no, we really aren't Nazis. No, we really aren't anti-gay. Right. No, we really aren't. And the, the, the French sexist. Revolution is actually a yeah. really great example because people like Robespierre, they enabled a mob, and then the mob, I don't know whether Dr. Guillotine was actually killed. I think that might just be one of those pieces of trivia. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fun and, and it's instructive fun story to remember. Anyway, it's, yeah. a, it's to remember, if you, if you enable the mob, who's to say it won't turn on you? Mob justice isn't rational, and people think that they can kind of wield the irrationality or give into it for a time. It's like, well, yeah. And the whole point of establishing mob justice is to make it safe for, for them to come after you. Right. Mm. Right. Like the whole point of, you know, now we've got our line in the sand and our article in the New York times, we've got Nazis in the marketplace and therefore we have Nazis in the marketplace. We can't do business with Nazis because that supports a Nazi agenda. Okay. Now what we have decided is we can discriminate against anybody based on their ideology. We can cut off their businesses. We can cut them off from the marketplace altogether. We can refuse business to them because we have a label for their thoughts that makes them anathema and worthy of death. And that's, that's really what's happening here. These people have committed thought crimes. Somewhere on the internet, the mob has decided that this is the worst of all possible thought crimes. And therefore, we can put them out of business. We can run them off the streets. We can refuse to do business with them at all. And every time we step up to the plate in something like this to decry, yeah, this is, yeah, we agree. We are, we're also anti-Nazi. Yeah, we're also anti-anti-gay. Yeah, we're also anti-sexist, wh- whatever it is. Like, wh- what we may be saying may be true. We are anti-Nazi, real Nazi. We're not anti-gay. If what you mean by anti-gay is we hate gay people. No, we actually really love people who are gay. That's why we call them to repentance. But whenever we line up to make our protests and to agree with these protests, we're enabling this whole system of mob justice that will come back mm-hmm. for us. Right, we're, we're arguing about whether we've broken 
the thought crime laws when what we should be yeah. saying is you cannot hold us to thought crime laws. Yeah. There's no such thing as thought crime. Right. This, exactly. Yeah, it's it's a it's a matter. I mean, as Jake's been talking, I was thinking of Nebuchadnezzar setting up a big gold statue and saying, "Okay, as soon as these guys play their instruments, you better bow." Mm-hmm. And like the statement we read from our mayor is basically like, I don't know, it's He's it's, playing the instruments. He's playing the instruments. He's also bowing the knee. <laughs> To, to this mob justice mentality and this whole idea of thought crimes. I mean, in but other he's words... he's calling all of us to bow too. He's calling us, to, yeah, he's calling us to worship. He's yeah. not just calling us to make distinctions because the fact is, this is like a, the Pledge of Allegiance or something. If you will talk like we talk and say no to what we say no to and yes to what we say yes to, then we will know that you are for us. But if you will not, we will know you're against us. Right. Yep. And we as Christians say, well, actually, we do say no to what you say no to. It's just that we do it this way. And if you'll just allow us to do it this way. But that's not how it works. Yeah. What these people want is to simply establish the principle. Mm-hmm. If they've established the principle that we have somebody with a hateful ideology that is a public menace. And therefore, since we all agree that this ideology is a hateful public menace, we can deny these people the right to sell in the marketplace and the right to buy in the marketplace. That's that's it. That's the whole. That really is. That's the ball game. It's it's a it's a that's package. That's persecution. It's, a, it's, it's coming. A, they they have created a monster, and we have said the monster should eat those people, not eat us. And instead, we should say the monster needs to die. The monster needs to die. But we refuse to say that. We just say as long as the monster is eating some meat over there and not eating me, I'm okay. But you can't be okay with a monster. That's right. Well, guys, that brings us... Now, now I want everybody to hold this thought, because we're going to take a little detour here. And I call this detour an interesting sidebar about the SBC. Now, Ben, what is the SBC? Uh, Well, the SBC is the Southern Baptist Convention, Nathan, Christian denomination here in the U.S., world's largest Baptist denomination, and the largest protestant denomination that we have in the states i assume most people know that but just yeah, just just go. yeah now you may have read stories uh brought forward earlier this year by the houston chronicle and the san antonio express news about more than 700 victims of sexual abuse by clergy and leadership within the sbc yeah they've been having kind of a hard time and at their annual conference this summer in birmingham uh, the sbc amended their constitution to say that churches could in fact be expelled for mishandling or covering up sexual abuse But let's move away from that just a little bit, because there were also some other things that happened at this year's conference that tie into what we've been talking about. Yeah. So SBC, think of the the key word for our purposes, at least, is Southern. They have a long history with slavery. They've been trying to recover from it. They're not proud of it. And we don't necessarily have a problem with them wanting to disassociate themselves from that past, necessarily. No, but let's talk about what happened this year, which is they passed a resolution called on critical race theory and intersectionality. Whoa, Nathan, what? I Explain these terms to me. I don't understand critical race theory or intersectionality. What do, is this? Do you really not understand these terms? Uh, I, just, get woke, baby. Yeah, uh, get woke, baby. Sorry, look, guys, I agree with what you agree with, okay? Just don't <laughs> kill me. <laughs> well, according to the true master of all thought, Wikipedia, Critical race theory is a theoretical framework in the social sciences that uses critical theory to examine society and culture as they relate to categorizations of race, law, and power. Okay, so what's critical theory? Well, according to Dictionary.com, critical theory is a philosophical approach to culture and especially to literature that seeks to confront the social, historical, and ideological forces and structures that produce and constrain it. Okay, so what is, what are you saying? Ben, don't don't you know what I'm talking about? I, oh, I, I, not, yeah, I, I'm asking on behalf of our listeners. Oh... Uh... Okay, well, listen, if you've seen one of those silly academic papers about, like, how Jane Austen's novels are rooted in the oppression of women by the patriarchy, that comes out of something called critical theory. Yeah, and it's basically building on Marxism, right? So Marx saw society as structured entirely along lines of who has power. The bourgeoisie exploit the proletariat, the rich people exploit the workers, so on and so forth. And and so, so, so critical theory basically takes those power-colored glasses, if you will, and it just looks at everything else. So it's not just the rich and the poor, the bourgeoisie, the it's suddenly how men have power over women, white people have power over people of color, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, that means that when you read Jane Austen novel or you watch, I don't know, uh, The Matrix or right, whatever, you watch anything, you engage with a piece of art, you even read the newspaper, what you're looking for, if you like this stuff, is you're looking for who are the oppressors, who's the victim? And that brings us to critical race theory. Right. Now, critical race theory 
is obviously applying race to critical theory, and it's what we have to thank for terms like white privilege, microaggression. A lot of these concepts actually come out of critical race theory. Yeah, it assumes that critical race theory assumes that racist oppression is just embedded in our legal system. We can't we couldn't pull it out if we tried. I guess we're supposed to try. It's in our religious institutions. It's in like the mortar that makes up the foundation of society. And critical race theory is about pointing and saying, "Look, there it is in the mortar." We read a book together, uh, not for an episode of this podcast by ta Coates, mm-hmm. the black activist writer. And he talks about how it's systemic in a way that, can, you know, Ben said we should try, but can we? Yeah. He says we can't. He just says right. That's it's, right. it's impossible. It's yeah. impossible. It's just embedded in our institutions and in ourselves, in fact, in a way that's just unavoidable. President of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Al Muller, wrote regarding critical race theory, quote, The reality is that both intersectionality and critical race theory emerged from worldviews and from thinkers who were directly contrary to the Christian faith. Indeed, you can draw an intellectual line from Marxist theory to the transformation of Marxism, especially in the middle of the 20th century in European thought. And then you can fast forward to critical legal studies as they emerged in law schools, applying the same kinds of analysis, indeed even denying rationality and objective truth, and subjecting legal texts such as laws and constitutions to that kind of analysis. Okay, so he said intersectionality. That was the other thing from this resolution. Resolution. Uh, What is intersectionality? Intersectionality came out of critical race theory. It's the baby of a leftist law professor named Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. It teaches that people are oppressed from many different angles, not just race, but also class, gender, sexual orientation. Yeah, depending on how many of those things intersect in your life, you may or may not be more discriminated against than other people. Yeah, I actually took an online intersectionality test with these little sliders. You could move, like, how white am I? You could slide it all the way to white and all the way to person of color. How male am I? They had a whole spectrum on the slider. And it, I, I got an intersectionality score of 2%. Oh, horrors. I'm not very intersectional. So that brings us back to the SBC's resolution on critical race theory and intersectionality. Right. From the resolutions, I'm just going to read. Quote, whereas critical race theory is a set of analytical tools that explain how race has and continues to function in society and intersectionality is the study of how different personal characteristics overlap and inform one's experience. Whereas evangelical scholars who affirm the authority and sufficiency of scripture have employed selective insights from critical race theory and intersectionality to understand multifaceted social dynamics. Whereas critical race theory and intersectionality alone are insufficient to diagnose and redress the root causes of the social ills that they identify which result from sin, yet these analytical tools can aid in evaluating a variety of human experiences. Resolved that critical race theory and intersectionality should only be employed as analytical tools subordinate to scripture, not as transcendent ideological frameworks. So they basically said, it's a handy tool, but it's not one to be put above scripture and not to be taken as a defining worldview. Okay. So that sounds good. Well, okay. So ironically, the guy who brought the resolution forward, his name was Stephen Feinstein. He's a pastor at Sovereign Way Church in California. He said it was altered so much by the resolutions committee that it, it basically changed the entire purpose that he brought it forward. Uh, he, he did this interview with the Baptist Courier and said that his, quote, intent was to denounce critical race theory and intersectionality ideology so that we could hold accountable those espousing it, especially within the SBC institutions, unquote. He said that's what he wanted to to happen, but it became this much more nuanced statement about how it's basically can be a handy tool as long as you subordinate it to scripture. Okay, so they rewrote this resolution, and then they added a different resolution passed in Birmingham on contextual and cultural on contextual and cultural awareness for ministry. You know, I think I'm going to leave in the part where Jake stumbled over his word. We've all been stumbling over their words and our words as we talk about this stuff, and I think there's a point to be made about when people use big lang or big <laughs> big <laughs> Big, big language. Big, vague. <laughs> when people big language. <laughs> when people big, big language use around the survivors of perimeter to create. Um, uh, racist. <laughs> sorry. <Okay. laughs> um, <laughs> when people use big, vague language, there is always, some people have used it well, but or some people have used it for good purposes. But, you know, not making that point today. Uh, let me, let's read from this on contextual and cultural awareness for ministry, this other resolution. Quote, whereas obedience to the Great Commission requires the cultivation of competency and proficiency. Wow. Whereas obedience to the Great Commission requires the cultivation of competency and proficiency in contextual and cultural awareness. 
whereas ministers and ministry leaders benefit greatly from exposure to the history and the contributions of Christians from various ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Whereas without such equipping, ministers and ministry leaders may lack the cultural awareness to appropriately minister the gospel to people in their own circumstances. Whereas because the Southern Baptist Convention has been historically monolithic with respect to domestic ministry, preparation often occurs with limited access and awareness to contextual and cultural dynamics. Resolved that we affirm that fulfillment of the Great Commission requires proficiency in contextual and cultural awareness for effective gospel ministry in the 21st century. Resolved that we affirm and celebrate every current effort that our seminaries, entities, and churches undertake to resource and equip ministers of the gospel for effective ministry. Resolved that we urge our seminaries, entities, and churches to equip ministers and ministry leaders to be able to discern how culture and contexts shape ministry methods and strategies. Okay, so, so, wow. these two resolutions allow for any SBC church or organization to require racial or cultural training in their leadership. That's basically the app shot. They indicate that to be a good Christian, you have to be educated in a particular brand of liberal sensitivity. And that concludes an interesting sidebar on the SBC. Ah, uh-huh, very interesting. Yes, but is it relevant to the topic? <laughs> <laughs> well, my idiot friends, let me explain how it's relevant. Ben, All right. you've borne the weight of a lot of rhetorical <laughs> questions uh, in this episode. I really have. Uh, please explain to me something that I already know for the sake of our show. <laughs> Yay. Uh, okay. Ben's a smart guy, folks. He so, knows these things. So listen, this is exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about. The church... And specifically, and especially the Southern Baptist Convention, has long been accused of being racist. And guess what? They were formed from a split so that they could be a church that upheld slavery and slaveholders. Right. It's not like there's not real problems there. And so they're going out of, they've passed so many resolutions in the past, apologizing for slavery, apologizing for this, apologizing for that. Now we're into critical race theory. Just to support your point, Jake, there were two that uh, our little research elf included in here that I I didn't choose to make the final cut to the episode. But in 95, they had a resolution against racism, against breaking with their slavery, their their past. And sometime in the 2000s, they had a resolution against ever waving a Confederate flag. Like, it it feels like every couple of years, years, every 10 years or so, they come back around and they feel again, this, you guys are racist and this need to say, we're not racist. We're not racist. We're so much not racist that we agree with this and we agree with that and we agree with whatever. And so now what we have in the culture is critical race theory and intersectionality. And so we're going to teach it at our seminaries. We're going to support professors that teach this sort of thing. We're going to make it possible for churches to require the kind of cultural sensitivity training that you might go through in your pagan workplace, couched in these like gospel terms and whatever else. But it's really at the end of the day, It's not so much about actually being sensitive to black people in our churches. It's about waving the flag that says, I am not racist. Ironically, they're waving a white flag. The white flag of surrender. Yep. (laughs) Hey, Lance. Do me a favor. Oh, boy. <laughs> what what kind of favor, Chip? Go down to the farmer's market and buy me some rutabagas. Rutabagas? Chip, I didn't know anybody ate rutabagas. Huh? Well, I just never heard anybody actually eating rutabagas before. You can eat rutabagas? Uh, Thanks for the tip, Lance. Now, Chip, if, if you ain't eating the rutabagas, what exactly you want them for? I shoot them, Lance. You mean like for target practice? Target practice? No, 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 Lance. I use daikon radishes for target practice. Because they got the word dye in them. Dye as in yellow dye 47. Which is a color I hate. Yellow. So I shoot them. Well, Chip, ain't, ain't rutabagas yellow? Ah, yellow. Word that rhymes with jello. You know how much I love jello, Lance. There we go. Uh, I guess I'm a little confused there, Chip, because you just... Uh... I shoot them with my rutabaga cannon, Lance. Uh, Chip, would said uh, rutabaga cannon have anything to do with the, quote, vegetable hailstone panic, end quote, that I was reading about in yesterday's edition of the Sanityville Bugle? Let me answer your question with a question, Lance. Oh, dear. The vegetable hailstone panic that occurred at the farmer's market, I do believe. My question is, if 55 rutabagas oh, dear. weighing eight and a half pounds each... 
get shot out of a cannon at a rate of 250 kilometers per hour in a northwesterly direction at an angle of 80 degrees. With the wind coming from the south at 2 kilometers oh, per hour, there's a flock of African geese in the sky chip, right there in sort of a chip, W shape. Chip, 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 just let me, let me stop you right there because I think you answered my question already. Glad to be of service, Lance. Chip, listen, people at the farmer's market are terrified. You, you could have given some poor Amish farmer a concussion, Chip. Sorry, Lance, I didn't know the Amish lifestyle permitted concussions. Chip, you just can't mortar populated areas with rutabagas. How, how many times do I have to tell you that? I, I promise this time it'll sink in, Lance. Like a, well... Like a rutabaga that someone's fired, sinking into a populated area. Chip, the farmer's market's already in kind of an uproar already. Why is that, Lance? Because there's some white supremacist farmer selling Nazi vegetables, Chip. Don't you read the news? N- Nazi vegetables? You mean like an eggplant with a Nazi hat and a Hitler mustache, Lance? No, Chip. Oh, you, uh, you mean like a cucumber in the shape no, of a Nazi eagle? No, uh, no. You mean a selection of organic produce raised and sold by those who are in fact Nazis or at least white supremacists? Fascists. No, Chip. Uh, well... Actually, yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what I mean. That brings me to why I was firing my rutabagas into the farmer's market, Lance. Now, Chip, violence don't solve fascism, except, except when, when it does. That's my model too, Lance. But I fired my rutabaga because of them possum killers, Lance. What? That's right. Some people at the farmer's market kill possums. You mean like farmers trying to protect their crops from said possums, Chip? No, Lance. I mean the people who accidentally run over them at night and they can't see the possums trying to cross the road. Chip. <laughs> so some of those very people sell vegetables at the farmer's market. Now, Chip. Some of those very people buy vegetables at the farmer's look, market. Chip, Chip, look. I wanted to teach everyone a lesson. Chip. The lesson is don't make me mad. Because when I get mad, I'll shoot you with your own rutabagas. Chip, you can't just... I know I done wrong, Lance. Well, good. Because I bought them rutabagas from a certain possum-killing farmer that's supporting his reign of terror. Chip, it ain't no crime to accidentally run over a possum in the middle of the night. You're a cold-blooded man, Lance Redford. And there ain't no reign of terror. Tell that to poor Petty the possum. Even if this farmer, uh, what's his name, Chip? More like Pancake Patty. <laughs> So called because she always liked pancakes when she was alive. Oh, <laughs> before she was flattened by that truck. Just like something really flat. Oh, last pancake patty. Chip, Chip, get a hold of yourself, man. Ku Klux Clarets. Say what? The possum killing son of a gun I bought my rutabagas from. Ku Klux Clarets? The white supremacist, fascist, racist farmer that everyone's in an uproar about? Ku Klux Clarets are a white supremacist? Well, you learn something new every day. See you, Lance. Do do do. Oh, hi, Holocaust Denied Don. Hello, Chip. Best stay away from the farmer's market. I understand there's Nazi sympathizers. Say, Chip, can I borrow your rutabaga cannon? The kids and I want to fire it off for Hitler's birthday. Sure thing, Don. Watch out for them Nazis. Do do do. Now, some, let me just make a little, a small devil's advocacy counter argument because we have Southern Baptist friends. I'm imagining one of them in particular who might say, well, guys, you just don't realize because you're not part of this, how much this stuff actually is necessary, how much in the actual Southern states, this kind of race, you know, real racism is still alive and how much we actually do need to still be addressing these issues, you know, from your little northern Midwest state in your little liberal university town. I actually don't realize how much these how issues this are still in is. play. Yeah, And I'll grant that to a degree. But my point isn't that we shouldn't be standing against racism. Right. Our point, and I know that people are going to hear this whole episode and be tempted to think, I mean, these guys are actually pro-racist and what they're making space for is racism and homophobia and sexism and whatever else. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're saying when you get caught playing the game, Mm -hmm. you've lost the game. Right. Mm. And that's, that's the point. We don't want to be defined and reacting to, uh, and on our heels when the liberals come to us making their big, broad accusations, we don't want to play their game and get caught up in the, no, look, see, here is how we are not. Well, and even to judge us that way, I think, is to be caught in their game. I mean, not to be too underhanded with our critics here, but the the game that the liberals play is a game of dichotomous thinking. Either you are this or you are a monster. 
And so to come back and judge our episode and say, either you guys tried to find some space to say there's some stuff that's bad with this, therefore you're on the monster side, therefore you're on the homophobic side, therefore you're on the, as like, we reject the we reject the dichotomy. We, right. we reject the way of asking questions that you have. Right. Yeah. So the whole thing is, if you're constantly responding to the accusation, you're buying into the premise behind the question, mm-hmm. and that's something that you can't do. It reminds me of our, our of something Quentin Tarantino did mm-hmm. <laughs> in, in what, that we talked about in a recent episode, where yeah. they came to him and said, "Are you afraid your movies are going to promote violence?" And he just says. I reject the premise behind he your literally question. Said, his, the literal quote is, I reject your premise. And I find that very lovable, actually. I don't, I don't agree <laughs> with Quentin Tarantino <laughs> rejecting that premise. I think he should have. But I, but I love the fact that he's willing to actually just say, I, I reject your premise. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to build on the foundation that you're Listen, offering it, me. Listen, it's a strategy. Mm-hmm. It's a strategy to put us on the defensive. Right. In a place where we don't need to be on the defensive. Christians are behind the abolition of slavery. We don't need to be on the defensive about that. Christians, I mean, for goodness sake, you have never found women better treated than in godly Christian societies. This is just not, we don't need to be on the defensive, but if we accept the fact that they're the accuser and we need to be on the defensive, then we've got a problem. And the problem is we're sucked into this game that is going to come back and it's going to end up biting us because we've accepted that at the end of the day, mob justice for thought crimes is absolutely legit. And what you need to do is simply prove that you're on the right side of the mob. And one day, if they start with these extremes, that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. But one day they will come after us. And that is the end game, I think. Mm -hmm. The end game is once we've established the principle that if you're on the wrong side of the mob, you deserve to be lynched, then... All we have to do is redef- is move the mob far enough so that you're on the wrong side of it. That is Nazism. That is the tools of the oppressors in all of these scenarios. Right. We're enabling, when we do that, we're enabling the very people that we're pur- purporting not to, to be. Are you, are you saying that Marx is basically an ideological oppressor? Yes. Hmm. Yes, I am. All righty. Down with Marx. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, uh, crap! I feel caught. <laughs> <laughs> we have you now. <laughs> so, if you, if if Jake, if you are the SBC and you have this history and you want to separate yourself from it, what do you do? That's a complicated question. It is a complicated. It is. Question, I agree. But I think you do it once and then you move on. Whatever it is you do, you do it once. If you're constantly living in the pressure of protesting against these accusations, at the end of the day, what you have to be able to do is say, look, I'm a part of a denomination. It has some things in its history. We have publicly acknowledged that this was sin. We have confessed that this was sin. We have repented of this. We are working to see that repentance through work through all of our churches. And what you need to judge me on is on the basis of my creed and my confession. Well, also what's fascinating about it, as you pointed out, 95, 2005 or so, now 2019 these things tend to go in cycles they tend to happen every 10 years and and what is that but a generation of young people judging their elders i mean i'm generalizing here but i think my generalization has some truth in that which is a, a new generation comes up and they want to dis- distance themselves from the sins of the past and it doesn't matter how much their dad distanced himself from the the sin of the past they want to say oh well actually he wasn't the woke one i'm the woke one and that's so, that's so arrogant, yep. and it's so disrespectful, and it's so nasty. It is the sin of, of Noah's son. I always forget which one is the bad one. Ham. Ham. It is the sin of Ham, right? We need to have a general respect for our forefathers, our forefathers in the faith, and in many cases, in this case, our actual fathers, you know, the people, the pastors, the leaders that came before us. And it doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge where they got it wrong, but there's an aura of just disrespectfulness to all of this that that I just don't like of, of 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 just proving well my dad was dumb but I'm the one who's finally got it figured out and what do you think yep. is going to happen your kid's going to come along and he's going to say my dad was dumb and I'm the one that finally got it figured out and, and that's the way of the world but as Christians aren't we supposed to be better than that aren't we supposed to respect men with gray hair aren't we supposed to honor our father and mother and that doesn't mean again people well, does that mean we should just no it doesn't mean we should just accept their sins but 
there ought to be an attitude of deference. We have to begin from deference. We have to begin from respect and then begin exploring how we move forward instead of beginning with the assumption that everyone who came before us was an idiot who didn't know what they were doing. So sounds like, Nathan, what you're saying is that all that racist stuff in the SBC's history, that's cool. And if you were SBC, you would honor that. That's how you would start. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, that's what I thought yeah. you were saying. Because they used to be racist, we should definitely, right. in order to show respect to our fathers. Right, yeah, you heard it be... here, listeners. That's what. Okay, that's not what Nathan means at all. I hope people can tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if they can. And I'm not, that's not an insult. I just think, what I think is that the air is so heavy with these ideas already mm-hmm. that it actually makes it hard to hear what Nathan is saying. That's yeah. what I think. I think for ordinary Christians, it's actually hard to understand the words that are coming out of his mouth. And the question that I just ask is like representative of the kind of question some women would still want to ask him. Right. What I just said, which I think was a dumb thing to ask, but it's in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our job as Christians is to believe all the Bible for all of our lives, for ourselves and for our neighbors. And that means that we stand and we fight for real justice and against real injustice. It means that we stand and we fight for the truth. And what that doesn't mean is that we spend all of our time apologizing for other Christians or other times and other eras. We can acknowledge the sins of our fathers. We can acknowledge our own sins. But we have to be able and willing to fight the battles today that are in front of us. And a lot of the battles today in front of us are battles for real justice, Mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Chesterton and, has this great point that he makes somewhere I forget where where he just where where he talks about he I think it's in the Blatchford controversies where he's arguing with a guy named Blatchford about uh, Christianity and one of the points that Blatchford made was well what about all the bad things what about the Inquisition you know that was a wicked thing how can something wicked come out of something good and Chesterton says Mr Blatchford do you understand yourself at all do you understand human nature. At all, because if you understand human nature, you understand our propensity to twist what's good into what's bad, and then you understand that if the greatest thing in the world happened, that would be the thing that would cause us some of the most trouble. That would be one of the things that, because it's so potent, because it's so real, would be most open to big abuses, because it's a big thing in and of itself. Justerson says it much more eloquently than. I just did. But he said, of course Christianity is associated with scandals. You know, some boring little philosophy that no one cares about isn't going to be associated with scandals because it's a boring little philosophy that nobody cares about. about. The big ideas are the ones that are going to have the big abuses. And you you, kind of have to understand that about the history of Christianity. And you also have to kind of take a bigger perspective on what it has meant for the gospel to work its way through society. If you consider the fact that all of Western civilization is a function of the impact of the gospel on Western civilization, right? Hmm. changing and uprooting paganism, creating foundations for just societies that allow technology and innovation to thrive, it's absurd that we even have to have this conversation. Yeah, when people mm. like to take the example of the Inquisition or the Crusades, the the, the nastiness yep. of the Crusades, yep. it's like to be mad about the Crusades is to be mad that the medicine healed all of our cancer, but left one tumor for a little while before it healed that too. Like people have been killing each other and stealing each other's stuff and raping each other's women for thousands of years, and then Christianity comes along and Western civilization actually starts to get a lot better. But there's still these little historically speaking these little outliers like the crusades which was a big deal i'm not minimizing the wickedness of what happened especially on the later crusades but it's like that's just one of the things that the corrective hadn't quite gotten to yet you Mm -hmm. know if you think about all the killing all the murdering all the taking that happened before that the the thing that you should note is actually not the one anomaly but the multitudinous instances of things going right yeah it's the things that we don't see and don't think about just one little accusation can shake us to the core or make us or our entire institution ready to kowtow Mm -hmm. to the latest cultural idols i've been thinking also as we go and i think we've touched on this point before but i've been thinking about the the entertainment that we watch as we record this the trailer for birds of prey just came out which is the harley quinn movie and in the trailer there's all the women of gotham all the kind of bad girls of gotham and they're uniting to take down some even badder dudes of some type 
And, yeah. and there's just all these kind of violent or mean-spirited moments where people are hurting each other, or, or specifically where the women are hurting these men. These men. It leaves me with a queasy feeling because it's not justice being done. What it actually is is it's the same kind of mob justice that we've been talking about because men, the bad guys, have been demonized have been made to just be monsters and now it's okay for Harley Quinn and her comrade desses and arms to just destroy them, mutilate them, hurt them. When I think about those kinds of movies, I get scared about the very kind of persecution that we've been talking about. There's just been a coarsening and a bifurcation that's been happening in entertainment where there's the us, you know, there's the Guardians of the Galaxy and then there's all the other people in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies and those people deserve to die if, the, if they're in the Guardians of the Galaxy's if, if way. If they die in a particularly they're painful not us. way, right. it will be funny. Right, right. It is in fact funny and we are not called to empathize with their pain at all because like, yeah, they're, they're not us. And the more that those movies make it cool for us to take down not us in brutal and funny ways then the more it's just all it's all a part of this trend that we're right. moving toward that will end up with the not us being Christians. Right. Period. That really is the end game is not us being Christians. Yeah. I mean, we talk, I, I, I referenced, people may remember my Star Wars story where I wrote an article about Star Wars, about femi- against feminism in movies, basically. And people, the internet went nuts and we had lots of, you can listen to us talk about that in other mm-hmm. places. There's an early episode of Sanity Mach 1 called Get Behind Me Star Wars or something like that. I don't know. You can yeah. listen. To, you can listen to the whole story. That taught me my lesson because I'm, I, in many ways, stand by that article. There's maybe a couple places that I don't. Basically, theologically, and in terms of the truth of the article, I think we'd all stand by it. Maybe it could have been written differently. But one of the lessons of the article was I am a culturally and pop culturally savvy guy i know my movies i know my references i know all that stuff and so i really thought i could make a little space for myself to speak the truth by just showing off my nerd cred and now i show off my nerd cred in our sound of sanity episodes and i just do it you know for fun and for profit and for edification and i hope it's fun and helpful for people but, but you have no illusions that your nerd credit's buying you absolutely anything. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and the fact is, that, that's, that's the point I want to make. This was, this was a profound lesson in my life. It bought me nothing. Nothing. Not one iota. Not a single breath. Not a single minute for me to speak a, another word of truth was bought by all my nerd cred. And I have, I think, a lot yep. on, this, on that particular topic. And nobody, nobody, absolutely nobody nobody cared yep like it did not matter it bought me nothing and now i see all these christians whether they're in the sbc whether they're in my home church whether they're just people i know and they think that if they can show that they have academic cred if they can show that they have cultural cred if they can show that they have wokefulness liberal wokefulness Mm. whatever it is look at the letters by my name look at the letters in front of my name look at the I understand that we need to love... Look at my references. Gay people, I understand that we shouldn't be Nazis. I Look, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Christ is the aroma of death to those who are perishing, and they hate it. And it yep. says, you know, they hated me, they'll hate you. Christ said that. Like, if you're going to stand with Christ, you're going to be hated. And if you're not going to stand with Christ, then you won't be hated. Yeah, and I think that that's the real lesson to learn in the middle of all of this. For us as Christians, I think it's not just about saying, hey, let's stop playing the game because playing the game's enabling the game and then they're going to come get us. It's about, hey, let's be free to just be Christians mm-hmm. and to proclaim the truth to people and to not be bound up in what the world thinks. Who cares what they think? Who cares? Mm-hmm. Right? The first Christians were slandered as atheists, for goodness sakes. Like the Roman Empire, the charges brought against the first Christians were that they were atheists. Are they atheists? No. They're the only non-atheists in the (laughs) whole Roman Empire. In the the whole Roman Empire. (laughs) But the charge is atheism. Right. They they just needed something to attach to them that allowed them to silence the witness of those who were calling the world to repentance. That's going to happen. Well, the yeah, the the problem with that though was like the was almost exactly like the problem we're talking about now. It was that Jesus was exclusive, and so in worshiping Jesus as God, they were denying all the other gods of Rome, and hence atheists, because you're saying all our gods are, you know, not. Yeah, but not all these other people were, were 
actually believed in these gods. What they were really sure. denying was the Pax Romana. Yes. They were disrupting the peace of the Roman Empire that allowed us, you know, hashtag coexist. Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. so the instant that you say, nope, Jesus cannot coexist with your pantheon of false gods. No, we will not go along to get along. No, we will not play your games. Christ is Lord over all. It's exclusive. Then that's it. And they were right. Yeah. They were right to know that that was a threat to the foundation of the Roman Empire. Yeah, it, it was. was. Absolutely, it was. While being no threat whatsoever. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, and the same is true of all Christians who maintain any kind of witness with integrity today. We're no threat to the governing authorities. We will respect and submit to them insofar as they allow us to live peaceably with all men. And yet, we're a threat. Yeah. Because we stand against the Pax Americana. Yeah. Which is coexist. Right. And there's nothing dumber than someone who is a threat going around saying, Oh, well, I'm, I'm not a threat. I'm not like, nobody buys that. Either you are or you aren't. But let's stop playing the game of... Do I have to prove that I'm not a threat? Do right. I have to prove that I am a... How about we just call our neighbors to love Jesus and to repent of their sins and to be freed from the dominion of sin and Satan? Sounds well, good. and the irony of all this, I think, is that we think if we feed the monster a little bit, keep it from eating us, if we if we allow the thought crime system to perpetuate itself, we'll actually buy ourselves a little space. Obviously, the first irony is we don't, as we've been talking about this whole episode, we lose space. But when we don't, that's when we actually buy ourselves space because then we're just living as Christians and people know what we stand for. They know what we threaten and they see us for people, you know, like yep. you, you, you love somebody and you call them to repentance and then you live next to them and you babysit their kids or, or, or you help fix their faucet or something. And suddenly they can't demonize you. If you're always pretending to be just like them, and then you fix their faucet. Well, of course you fix their faucet because that's what a good neighbor does. But if you're the guy that believes homosexuality is a sin that fixes their faucet, then that's a powerful witness. And that actually makes a little space. That actually puts a face on the nameless goon that Harley Quinn is able to just decimate and says, well, maybe, maybe we can't decimate this. The way that Christians buy space is by actually just being as loud and proud about what they believe is possible. Sound of Sanity was produced by me, executive produced by Jake and me, associate produced by Benjamin J. Sulzer. Go to patreon.com forward slash sign of sanity to support this work. Until next time, folks. Stay sane.